Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the April 3rd um, regular school board meeting. Tom Newkirk is absent tonight. Um, he wasn't able to be here. Um, so I have the pleasure of cheering on this very busy evening. <laughs> um, first order of business is a agenda, and I understand that Dr. Morse has something he would like to add. Um, if I could just add the nomination of um, a counselor for the high school, I'd appreciate it. Any other changes? Okay, um, with that change, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Brian? Motion, second. motion to accept the agenda. Second? I'll second. Okay, Dan seconds. All in favor? Six in favor and student rep in favor. Okay, uh, public comments? Okay. Um, and now um, we are going to move on to the architect report. Do you want to do the minutes? The oh, approval we do of the, the minutes? minutes first. I'm sorry. All right. All right. We'll do. I'm sorry. We'll hold on one more minute. We'll do the approval of the minutes. Um, can I have a motion to approve the March 20th regular meeting minutes? So moved. Okay. Second. second. Dan, second. Um, any changes? I had uh, one small change on page two. Um, under my uh, board comment, uh, when I talked about the performance at Johnson Theater, it should say at Johnson Theater with the um, high school orchestra, the middle school jazz band, and we'll talk. Any other changes? Okay, um, so with that, um, we to accept the minutes. Okay, all in favor, all six in favor, and student rep abstains? Mm -hmm. or, okay, so student rep in favor. Okay, now the architect report. <coughs> Hi again. Um, so we've been working uh, very closely with um, the committee and we wanted to bring everybody up to speed on where we are with the plans. And I'm kind of hoping that this will work. There we go. Um, so we're getting into more of a shape for the building, which you see here on the site plan. And um, what we see here is a bus loop that comes off of Co Drive and then a parking area with the field in between of two parking areas basically to separate um, however you want to separate it. It could be visitors, teachers on the other side. Um, the buses could be in the back, the linear parking lot uh, that you see right behind where it says car drop. That's where the parents would come in. So as we separate this, the other thing we started to look at is solar panels because we've talked about a net zero ready building. Um, so what that means is how many solar panels can we actually fit on the site? Um, the rectangular parking spaces that you see behind the car drop, the car drop off, um, that is roughly 20,000 square feet. And so then our building footprint, the piece anyway that would be not in shade and shadow on the roof, uh, is another 18,000 square feet. So basically we're looking at about, and this is just very rough numbers, about 30,000 square feet, plus or minus, of surface area if we were to put sort of a carport over that uh, rectilinear parking space and put the solar panels on the roof. Given the size of the building, we started doing some very quick energy analysis and it could be that we're looking at 50 to 60,000 square feet of solar panels. So we're about 20, <laughs> we have about half the space, uh, if you will. So we're still gonna try to come up with some creative ways to get more solar panels. Um, we did contact Revision Energy, um, Jack Rudiman from Revision Energy, and he said an, a solar array of that size is not a problem and they'd be happy to to talk to you about it, um, as would some other power purchase agreement companies. So that's what we've been looking at in terms of the site that's not building related. 
Um, and Dr. Morris has asked me to put together sort of a basis of design draft, if you will, based on owner's project requirements that talk more about the sustainability in the building um, and the energy analysis. And we're gonna put that together. We wanted to make some calls and do some, and some dimensioning first. Um, so any questions on the site? Would we need to look at some sort of lease back? Exactly. Um, like for the, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it is a lease to own. It is a long-term lease where you never own it, but they continue to own it. And then the third option is to buy it outright. It's the same company, Michael, that we, uh, the town of Durham used um, in turning, uh, putting in their solar farm. So they're very used to uh, Durham and they did a, a, just a mini project on the maintenance building for us as well. Drive and Denison, and then there's the uh, road now that most people use for the access that intersects with uh, Baghdad, which comes off of Madden. Yep. So I don't see that, and maybe I'm just not oriented right, but I don't see that on your map how that goes. It's off the scale, looks like. Baghdad is side. just the, the top. Yeah. Line. So at the tippity Going top, right off, right off the map, Kenny. So it's just off. Okay. Yeah. Your house is right behind. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just off. And Denison was the road that we were proposing maybe because two of Right. So I was just, um, I, I talked to um, Town Administrator Seligan. We have a meeting next week with uh, some of his department heads related to public safety, fire, planning. Um, and so we'll be sharing this concept with with them for the first time. I, I still think that this layout looks like it has a lot of paving on the property and I would challenge the committee to take one more look at how we can position the parking closer to the existing roadways so we don't have to take so much out of the site which is already limited in space for driveway space. Hmm. Yeah. Difficult to do with the amount of spaces we need. It's a, it's a very tight site. Well, we, there's a decision to, to bring the driveway down the hill in the, in the, west, in the left hand corner. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and that's I think what most impacts the amount of driveway there is. Mm -hmm. This here, what you're talking about? Yeah. And then that access road right there. Right. Yep. Yep. So I think um, we're at the point where we need to get our civil engineer engaged into this, these discussions because I think the other thing we have to look at is the grading uh, between Denison. This is Denison right here. And there is a grade change. There's a little hill here, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes that length of road, we're also trying to make it so it's not steep. Um, yep. So the buses can get up and down and the cars can get up well, and down. So hopefully there's we, not buses on that side. Yeah, but to, that's right, no buses over here, just the cars. But to your point, um, we do need to take a look at, because anything we can minimize in terms of asphalt, savings. You right. Know? right. Yep. Yeah. And I know it would, it would result in a lot of fill, but you know, further widening the, the already wide spot on Denison mm -hmm. um, that's there today might be one way to, to do that. To, to make the parking lot on that side of the field instead. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, all along here. Yeah, make that larger. Yeah. Yeah, certain, we can certainly take a look at doing. Okay, anything else, sir? So for the building, um, what we have <clears throat> tried to do, as you see here, is the aqua up at the top, that's your athletics. So that's the full size high school gym. Uh, we're looking at bleachers that seat approximately 200 people at the moment. Um, we have an adaptive PE space and we have changing rooms, uh, offices and storage that goes along with um, your PE program. And that's the aqua. Opposite side is all of the purple is your music program. And this is the front door. So as people come in the front door, uh, they go through the administration space, meaning they can't just walk into the school. They're all vetted, similar to what you have now um, in a little bit more of an organized um, way. 
and right off the main lobby is instrument storage. We had a lot of discussion with the students. We had a lot of discussion with the music program about the students being able to come in and drop their musical instruments um, and secure them right by the front door, which would also be right by the music program, so they're not lugging those things around um, all day. It's also an opportunity for parents who drop off and pick up instruments for it to be right by the front door, so they don't have to traverse through, through the building to get there. What you see in red up front is administrative space. So everything from your principal, vice principal, to counseling, the nurse, um, the SRO, an office for an SRO, all of that is the red up front. Uh, the thinking behind that is we now have administration on two corners of the building and it's welcoming. So you basically you have your eyes everywhere around the site like we've talked about, all eyes on the front door, um, multiple administrators because people get up and move around during the day. And so that gives us a lot of visibility up front um, as you come through the building, there's our dining commons and learning commons. So for two lunch periods during the day, that's where the students eat, and the whole rest of the time it's reading space and um, library space uh, for the rest of the day. Up in the upper right-hand corner of this slide is the kitchen and the servery. The servery, as students come uh, down the stairs to be served, they can either eat in the learning commons or go outside in the back of the building to eat. Um, so that servery serves both indoor and outdoor eating. And the kitchen is situated in those roads that Michael was just talking about. You know, one of those parking lots is, is the access to get the service to the back of that corner of the building. Oh. Bless you. Where's the way to get outside if you're going to eat outside? Right here? Yeah, what we're looking at right now are still diagrams, so we don't have doors and, and things like that um, shown in the plans. But when something is on an outside wall, there's opportunities there for both windows and doors. So right next to the servery is also the learning commons in, in terms of the library. So all of the yellow in the back of the school. So as someone comes into the building, they go through the lobby, through the dining and learning commons, and directly into the lobby, and you'll be able to see right through the school and see right through that learning commons to the back um, playground area and outdoor eating area and outdoor learning areas. Uh, so this yellow represents the library. There's a little, another little spot of red in the, in the back of the building. Uh, the thinking there is that if we were to move uh, SAU offices into the building, they'd be able to share space with the library. And then the SAU office is now on a third corner of the building. This is very different. And so the third corner of the building now has eyes on that third corner, if you will, which allows more administrative eyes um, looking around the building. And then back to the servery area, if we find a spot for maybe a, a maintenance office or a facilities director's office or something like that, that give, essentially gives you adult leadership on all four corners of the building looking out um, in, a, in a safe and secure way for the building. So that's pretty much how the, how the um, first floor is currently organized. This is a work in progress. We meet every Friday to try to make things better. And hopefully from what you've seen that we've sent in the past, this is getting better. Um, any thoughts about first row? Yep. Just a question about the recital hall. So no stage on, in the recital hall? So great question. Um, so we met with the music group and they talked about the fact that this is a recital hall, concert hall, however it's described but it's all about music, not about drama or performances. And so just like the, uh, I don't know if you've been down to the museum in, in Boston, the Gardner Museum, um, and some of the other new recital halls, they don't build stages. The orchestra sits and then the seats tear up. Um, you have handicapped seating down and what that does down at the bottom, and then it's almost like bleachers, but performing uh, performance seats. What that does is it saves area from that you normally see in ramps and uh, handicap lifts and things like that. All of that gets avoided um, by not having the stage. And when we were meeting with the music group and they were looking at the size of this and the way it was getting organized with uh, the stage itself, they questioned why do we even have a stage? Um, the other thing that that does is it allows a more intimate relationship here in the middle of the floor your orchestra can get as big or as small 
without having to come in and build up sections or take down sections of stage. Um, I think the last thing that it did was we were basing these, our initial design on sort of rules of thumb, if you will. And they've come back and they've promised us to get their orchestra together, put some four dots on the floor to see exactly how much space they need when the entire orchestra gets together. Um, and they've given us a schedule of the smaller elements of the orchestra and then the full orchestra, how many students that is. Um, and so with that, we're able to right size uh, the, the performance area. So we're not no longer calling it a stage, it's a performance area. So Denise, when um, Ron came in, I was present during the beginning parts of his discussion with staff, and the very first meeting we had was with the music department, and Ron came in with a design for a stage, and about halfway into that meeting, um, the music people came just came to the conclusion that a, for a music uh, hall, they don't need a stage. So they're the ones that recommended we eliminate the stage. Yeah. And, and I, I can understand that. I'm just, I guess, just wondering if that limits the middle school in terms of, you know, maybe you want to have a presenter to come in to talk to the kids about something. You know what I'm saying? Like, while I understand that that's obviously meant to be music oriented, that there could potentially be other sorts of presentations oh, sure. yeah, that any, come in. And yeah. I'm, just, I'm just questioning it, it, if that would be. I don't think so at all because, you know, a presenter would be intimate to the audience just like the music people are. Mm -hmm. What this is not designed to be is the, the, um, the high school auditorium. Right, right. So if a play is going on, that'll happen at the high school. Music is going on, that can happen here. If we have guest speakers, it could happen at either place because either place will serve, you know, serve well for guest speakers. Mm -hmm. and, and how many seats are at this point? Is right now it's between 950 and 1,000. Okay. And put it in the entrance and um, exit from both the um, gym space as well as the mm -hmm. idle space, mm -hmm. where, where is that? Are there alternatives rather than coming in through that main door? Um, no. So what we were trying to do was, whether it's school or community use, the building's designed so everybody comes through that front door. There are emergency egresses out. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the um, recital hall, there's a set of stairs right here that get you down outside uh, the building from the tiered seating. And then we have another two exits here You'll have to have three exits on a room that large. Same thing with the gymnasium. We're gonna need at least three exits. Uh, so we can come in here, we can come in here, cause that's connected right to the servery. So folks sitting in the bleachers would come right out, grab some snacks at halftime and go right back. Um, they could also come in this door and then there'd be doors directly to the outside for emergency egress only. So Ken, if you um, think about this building and how far we have to walk to the library and how far we have to walk to the auditorium from the entrance, in the new building, when you walk in, you're right on top of these spaces. So the front entrance, the way that we've been talking about the front entrance is it's part of the secure entry to the building and that we wanted to manage all traffic through that purposefully for security. But in this particular building, once they're in, they're right on top of the gym in the, in the performing uh, space immediately. So you're not walking miles to get there. I, I, and I, I get that. and. Um and I know that many people who use this building, when they want to come to the gym or the um, go to the performance place, they'll enter through that side entrance, which puts them right there. And then I was thinking too, with our concept, that perhaps we're going to have this as a community space um, for different community usage, and and maybe there's no solution, but we're opening the entire school when maybe all oh, no. one oh, no. is the gym. So this is the, when we get further down, Ken, you'll see um, that it's exactly the opposite of what, what you're seeing because you're just looking at the first floor. This first floor would be open to the community. Um, the second and third floor wouldn't be, the fourth floor, because that's where our students are. So this, this you're looking at, if we, if we just develop the idea of this serving the community, you're looking at the space that would serve the community as you walk in without ever, ever touching classroom space. Um, and then will there be some sort of a ticket office for, mm -hmm. you know, selling either tickets for athletic events or the music? Yes. The musical events, okay. Yeah, we'll make sure we have that in there. Okay. 
How, how many seats is the auditorium here, just for comparison? It's um, five, 528. So Ron, I noticed too, the um, servery has moved since the last diagram. Correct. Did that, did that make the gym bigger or did you go out farther in the back? How so actually what was happening is the gym was oriented 90 degrees, which meant it was going out further this way. Oh. And we were looking at this and things were just not well organized at that point because it's a work in progress. But the servery in the kitchen seemed to really be squished between the stair that's there and, and the gym. And the other thing was the question came when the students are done eating inside, how do they get to the play area um, outdoors for recess? And so one of the comments that was made by uh, the library folks uh, in the building and a lot of the other teachers and, and administrators was, let's find a good way for the students to get outside and eat without having to possibly go through a stair or something like that to get outside or to get through the library to, to get outside. So by making that move of rotating the gym, so now it's oriented in this direction and not that direction, it also allowed us to get the bleaches here, so when people come in, they don't have to walk across the floor oh, yeah. to watch a game. Um, and then the servery here. So the servery now really serves food into the library, into the dining commons, um, and into the gym. And then obviously anybody from the recital hall comes out into that dining commons as sort of a big lobby um, during, those, during those sessions. And as, as Dr. Morse pointed out, there's, aside from the music program, PE, and library, there's no academic space on the first floor. Most students will spend the majority of their day on the second, third, and fourth floor. So uh, it's just another way to separate or have a buffer between the community coming in and the actual regularly occupied classrooms. The um, <clears throat> recital hall, the exterior wall, mm -hmm. the, the seating comes up a significant correct correct so it, would that just be a block wall on the outside or it I guess my question is was there any consideration given to turning it 180 degrees so mm -hmm. you could have windows? we can certainly look at that right. yeah I think right now though because it is a music hall and not a drama space we're thinking that yes there's solid wall up to the the height of the seats but then above that we want to harvest as much daylighting as we can and so uh, we've got some great pictures from the Boston Conservatory that we also went to visit on this, which is a relatively new building. Um, and it was very interesting to see that they have basically windows just like this um, all through their orchestra performance space. Um, because that was one of the things um, that they were concerned about since they were gonna build a new building. They didn't see any need to have this black, you know, no daylight box um, because music doesn't like that. And, Quite frankly, music lights likes light. So, didn't that also allow you to have an opportunity to look at storage, a little bit of storage yep. under there? Oh, that's so another great the point. So this corner right here acts as our egress out, but then this corner right here could have a door on the outside, which allows outdoor storage, um, and that could be an outdoor storage for whatever uh, the maintenance crew um, and gym needs, um, basically to maintain the property. So that was another opportunity, having it in this direction. Uh, this is also an opportunity to have that be a glass wall so that when you're here, you see in and basically now you have music in the round. Um, and again, if this is glass here and this is glass here, you're again seeing right through and out of the building from that common area, so, which is always good to uh, be able to see so you don't feel like you're cramped. Your sight lines go outside the building. This isn't pressing at all, but it'll be helpful to have an estimate of the operating cost savings of moving the SAU offices in. Are you thinking this would replace the current SAU office or is yeah, this additional would, space? Um, it would be, what I would do is repurpose the current building and put the IT department over there because they're crowded in the maintenance building with no light. So if we move the SAU office up here, we could move the IT department across the street and give them a serviceable building to work from. So on the second floor, 
we have what we call destination learning spaces. Um, the third and fourth floor are all about teams, and, and you'll see the colors in a minute. <laughs> but um, it's all about teams. So on the second floor, we have an opportunity to have more music. So the chorus room, when we met with the with the um, with the music group, they said that there's no reason the chorus can't be on an upper floor that actually then overlooks the band room. Um, or even as we've been thinking, maybe the chorus room goes in the center of the building. So as you come into the building, you see music right there front and center. Um, and then world language. And so this side of the building becomes still part of our music and world language area. And this part of the building becomes art and STEM, creating a STEAM uh, environment, which is right upstairs from the library. And with the hole in the floor, as you come in through the building, you're able to see the library right in front of you and STEAM um, or art and STEM uh, right upstairs. And so that was, um, and then both of those art and STEM look down into the library space. So there's really a connection between library and STEM and art. Uh, and that was, that was important as we talked to everybody in terms of how do these educational spaces connect. And that was a very strong connection that they felt uh, was, was needed. You can then uh, overlook, you see the balcony from the recital hall. And as you come across and you walk between uh, world language and art, you can look down. The two violet pieces here that overlook the hole in the floor in the dining commons as well as the hole in the floor for the double height gym is the health classrooms. Um, so health classrooms basically gets all of the daylighting from the gym that's coming through as borrowed light, but they overlook uh, the gym. And what you see here in the red is um, special ed and counseling, they wanna be dispersed throughout the whole building. So obviously you've seen them on the first floor and then we've got offices for them on the second floor. So essentially the second floor becomes the electives, if you will, for the middle school. Mm -hmm. So then the third floor, um, we just threw some color in here as we were starting the meeting to delineate four teams. So each floor has four teams and you can use these floors however you see fit. You can group fifth grade and sixth grade, seventh grade and eighth grade or have um, multiple setups if you will. The team area in between is where they can bring the entire team together uh, for any kind of announcements, any kind of work activities, any kind of group, large group team um, lectures or discussions. And what you also see here in the middle is the student commons. So you see four stairs for four teams. So as the students come in the building, you're not taking 700 students and kind of sending them up one or two stairs and then have a back fire stair or such. You essentially have four stairways, one stairway um, for two teams because as the team goes up. So what that means is if you wanted to put this area here the, as the fifth grade and then upstairs is the fifth grade again, then that stair becomes dedicated to the fifth grade and one grade is right above the other. If you want to have the purple and the green be fifth grade, then maybe fifth and sixth use this stair, sixth grade being upstairs, fifth grade being downstairs. There's all sorts of different ways you can do it, knowing that you have one team and, and one stair. The stair themselves are on the outside of the building because we talked about purposeful movement in the building uh, with the teachers and with the students. So as they're going up and down that stair, these stairs want to be designed almost like greenhouses. Um, so there are plants in the stairs and there's lots of daylighting uh, and glass. So you don't feel like you're in a stairwell moving up and down, but you really feel like you're in a really nice space. Um, and the students obviously move and exercise as they're going uh, through the building. That dashed line right there uh, represents a glass wall so that when the students are out here, either using the restrooms um, or meeting with the specialists or going to their lockers, there's still an acoustic separation, yet it's completely wide open for visibility um, and for oversight. The middle of the building is the same on both sides. We have faculty rooms on each side. Um, there is a... Both, both floors, right? Yep. 
both floors. So essentially there's four faculty rooms, two per floor and one per two teams. We have in, in the team organization, we have these special ed resource rooms um, and then we have two breakout spaces. So every team gets a resource room plus two uh, breakout spaces that can be used. And then we have a specialist. So there's four specialists, um, two math um, and two, so there's two reading. math and two reading. And so we have basically a reading and a math specialist on each floor. And then we were talking about this little yellow space here being a breakfast nook. When we met with food service and we met with the students, you know, they talked about how they eat today, um, where they have to go and where they don't have to go, and how many students actually eat breakfast. And the fact that when the middle school students show up prior to classes starting, it's more of a social event. And then they get to class and realize we haven't eaten. <laughs> um, and so this is an opportunity to bring food upstairs into the team areas um, so that the breakfast is readily available. Uh, if they want to grab you know, a breakfast sandwich or something like that when they get up to their locker. So they can have the social hour but also not miss a meal. Um, and that a breakfast nook would also be a vending. You know, we talked about maybe having a fruit vending machine or you know, some kind of vending that the students can access to uh, all day long. The fourth floor is identical. The fourth floor is set up identical where we have four teams, four stairs, and the core of the building and the student commons remains the same. So I think it's been um, a real good process to date. We do have to now take this and go back to the faculty. Um, we have to get the students engaged again to get their ideas. Um, but that's, you know, it's, it's one big work in progress. Um, but we are shooting for the beginning of mid-May to have a very strong schematic design so everybody sees exactly uh, what it is we're talking about. And we are developing right now interior views of that common area in the middle of the building that we've talked about, um, interior views of what the recital hall might look like. And we've got to sit down with the faculty to start talking about the concept design for the classrooms. Um, and then we can do a vignette of that. And obviously we have some exterior sketching uh, going on that we're going to meet with the committee next Friday to review. Any questions? How, what, um, how many more office spaces are there here than would currently be needed or would be needed for the current middle school staff? I don't, I'm not sure what you're asking, Michael. Yeah. How many, how much room for growth in the faculty is there? When I hear you describe the, the, the office and program spaces, mm -hmm. it sounds like it's designed for what we offer today. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that means if we want to add something, then something else has to give. We have to take something away or, or, or shrink something. Well, hopefully the building is designed in a flexible way where you can add the office. So you see all this, you know, these common areas that we're talking about here. And then again on the second floor. You know, it is important for you to be able to modify this because we all know it's not going to stay the same, right, for, for decades. Um, things will change and as things change, like for instance, you could put another office here um, on each floor. You could decide to do breakfast a different way and open up that space. Instead of having a breakfast nook, you could make that into an office. On the first floor, the same thing. We've talked about, I think there is space for an additional counselor um, in the building or there was some discussion about how many counselors you have now versus how many you already plan to have when the, when the building opens. So I wouldn't necessarily, that's built for future, but built for when it opens. Um, so I, I think I actually asked this question last time, which what I said is that when you do our long range planning, we only go out 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's approximately the error at 10 years out is call it 10%. And so what I said is, looking at this plan, what does it look like plus or minus 20%, which is what you're just asking, right? It's like if the school, I mean, who knows what will happen in 30 years, maybe the birth rate changes and it explodes and, and therefore we experience a growth of, so asking those two, those are the two extremes I would throw out there, not just if we grew 20%, but what if we shrunk 20%, how would this building? So I think that's kind of the question I asked last time. Well, and, I, and I'm, maybe I'm not so much worried about 
that much, the, you know, the extremes of the potential student population change, but more about programming. Because even if the student population is the same, which is what we expect based on long-range planning, right. we're going to continue to find additional needs and opportunities. You know, it, it's it's been um, technology integrators. It's going to be probably world language. There, right. there are going to be things like that that we want to add. And if we only design the space for what we have today, then we're going to start off and two years down the road be remodeling. But I, again, inclusive in growing 20%, you're going to add staff. Uh, uh, so you mean, so it kind That's of, a whole different equation if we get that. No, yeah, yeah. but when yeah. you think of that, so if you're thinking of adding staff, it's kind of what you're saying, because you may add technology integrators or anything. Yeah. If you assume there's a 20% growth in students, there's a therefore a, a growth in staff that's going to go along yes. with that. So that kind of, yep. how do you accommodate a growth in staff of that size? So mm -hmm. it's kind of the same question, yeah. I think. Good question for us to ponder, because there's no answer tonight for that, because we were, we were estimating the student population based on the long-range planning of being pretty consistent, but we assumed that this building would hold 700 students, which is about um, 40 more students than we have today. Um, so, you know, I think we have to think about that some more, Michael. I mean, we, we definitely, can, we, we, when we built the world language piece, we made an assumption that potentially we would expand into the fifth grade. So that's, that's incorporated. Um, but in terms of other programs, I, the, the middle school seemed a pretty stable unit um, overall. We did, we did put in an extra counseling space just in case. But really, those are the only two things I could see on the horizon. And beyond that, I, I don't know what more the, the what more staffing we would need for the middle school. But I think to Michael's point, um, years ago, before the enhancement of our music program, perhaps that drive for that performance recital space would not have been so huge. But with the tremendous mm -hmm. growth in strings and our oh, music I, participation. I, yeah. It's become paramount, so such a big part of the building is now geared to that. And I think what Michael is saying, and I think astutely, is that there are things on the horizon, and we might know what they are. And and I think Michael's just asking, and I would share, what is the flexibility? Um, yeah. Kind of like on the town side when we plan for the hundred year storms. That's a better you know, way to put it. Yeah, that's yeah. what what I think what we're trying to do. My assumption when I saw the um, SAU space on here, obviously, was that we would be moving out of the existing SAU office space. So I, that makes, and I, I understand that's not what your, the current thinking is, but is there a possibility to add a partial fifth floor to consolidate administrative space here? Um, the the capital plan includes a large number of upgrades to the current SAU office space based on its age and, and maintenance status. So um, is it worth consolidating? Mm -hmm. Well, one of, the, one of the reasons that I asked Ron to think about putting the SAU office in the middle school is, um, well, there's a couple of reasons. One, I think it does enhance the security of the building by having another corner covered, but originally it was to put the SAU office in conjunction with students. Um, I always, philosophically, I've felt that the superintendent's office should be much, much closer to students than the current SAU building, and this provided the opportunity to bring SAU administration closer to kids. So that was really what drove it initially. It wasn't necessarily about the cost of running the SAU building. The utilities to run the SAU building are pretty minimal, but the structure itself is pretty tired. And so when you look at the capital plan, you know, we do have to put some money into that building. And I questioned whether it was money well, well spent um, if we could occupy uh, a, a space in, in the new middle school. I will say something that I said to Todd, because when I was superintendent in Portland, the SAU was part of the CTE Center, 
and as the um, Casco Bay High School was their alternative high school, so they had three high schools in Portland, and Casco Bay High School started to grow pretty dramatically, and it was easy for me to see the superintendent's office leaving the building in order for that student growth. So, you know, that speaks a little bit to the question you were asking. I mean, if, if student and staff need um, started to grow, the first thing I would suggest is that the SAU office is in the way. Right now, it can occupy that building with a projection of 700 students pretty well. But if we were using ALS plus or minus 20%, um, obviously minus 20%, there'd be plenty of room. But if we actually grew by 20%, um, that would be one big middle school that nobody's projecting um, in its at this point. So, you know, I I do get the idea of what you guys are talking about. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be um, contrary. I just um, think that as we look at this building, you would have to flex out space if you were going to grow. So the first space I would flex out would be the superintendent's office because that's the logical thing to push out not to make room for kids. Um, in terms of office space, I think there's plenty of space in this building to create new office space if that's what we needed, like new additional special ed spaces. I think that can be a rel relatively easy thing to accomplish. Um, but if we're talking Al's point of that kind of growth in students, the building's too small. You know, that's just the reality of 20%. Of, of there's no yeah, way. No. And the community wouldn't support us right. building no, I hear you. A, a, a school that's that you know we're projecting at 660, we're building for 700. They would they would crucify us if we said we wanted to build a building for 850 just in case. Do well, of course, especially <laughs> given the decline of yeah of birth rate. So I think my I, th I I I understand the question, and I certainly I think it's worth bringing back to the committee and struggling with a little bit, but it hasn't been our primary focus yet. And and um kind of. Um, maybe related to that, probably not, and probably a ridiculous thought, but when you turn off of Baghdad and you come to the current middle school, and it's land that is very precious, and trying to have flexibility, there are two houses there. Mm -hmm. One is currently for sale, and one is a student rental. Yeah. Does it make sense for the school board and Oyster River Community School District to think about trying to buy that property because that adds a tremendous amount of real estate that gives us more flexibility in the future for, for many things, and whether it's less that, yeah, concrete. Kenny, it's not, it's not a crazy idea at all. It's a conversation that's been happening in the district since the high school was um, built because there's all kinds of property at that point had the district bought, on, bought at the time would have allowed more elbow room for fields and so forth. But um, it's really hard to contemplate buying property because for a school system, you need a warrant in order to um, purchase property. And so I, I, the idea is absolutely the right idea. It's just the timeliness of being able to do anything in terms of purchasing is such a, you have to say to a buyer, um, we're interested in your property and, and um, you know, the votes in March and whether people are willing to do Sell that, it, it would be, to, you know. Right, to try to get the ducks in a row right. to accomplish it. Cause but yeah, I think any time that we, we could pr purchase property around the middle school, around the high school, we should be looking at it. We did look at the property, remember, across the street from the high school, but it, the grades were so severe that it would have cost. <coughs> cost the taxpayers hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to utilize that that space. So uh, that, however, is pretty level with, you know, Denison and, you know, would be ideal property for us to own. I, I'm just thinking, though, you know, and I understand, obviously, you can't build a school for 850 when the projection is nowhere near there. But just in terms of if down the road at some point it needed to be added on, you know, is there a possibility at all? And because it's such a tight space, you know, or is it, or is this it? You know, and if, it, if this is it, 
then, you know, obviously that would mean that, you know, worst case scenario, there would have to be another kind of solution. Maybe that would mean bringing fifth grade back to elementary schools or something like that down the road. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I could foresee that because you don't know what happens 20, 30 years down the road. Um, but, you know, I, I would imagine that we could look at those possibilities if it wasn't possible to say, oh yeah, well, there's room for expansion in this corner or what have you. Could, could it go up a floor? Yeah, that's what it's going to Exactly, be. so Michael had brought this up um, a little while back about if we stay on the existing site, are we limited, does it, does it expand? And so in, in this design on the second floor, you see that that space um, right now is an opening down to below. So you easily, not easily, but we're talking about, rent, you know, a flexible and adaptable building is the goal. So how do you adapt this building? Uh, you put floor joists in here and that becomes a floor with outdoor windows. You also have an opportunity to leave this the way it is. These are roof areas right here. Um, and so what we were thinking was these would be great roof areas for art outside on the, on the obviously a, you know, almost like a patio if you think with railings and such and being secure. Same thing for art and for STEM. But in the future, these rooms can be reconfigurated or reconfigured. <laughs> <laughs> That's not gonna live that one down. Um, and then so can be re re reconfigured um, to get more space. So you could get two classrooms in this area, two classrooms in this area. As you then go upstairs, um, those areas keep going. So these two rooms right here would go away, but then you'd have a room and a room and a room and a room. And so you could do that on the third floor and the fourth floor. So if we just think a little bit about that now and size the foundations and the columns, so that in the future you can come and put up the new steel and put up the new floors and put that stuff up. Then what you have is, the, is a design, not necessarily you know, the design that says here's your plan for future classrooms, but you have the possibility to make it very easy um, to do this. Uh, you also have a geothermal system. The nice thing about geothermal systems is they're very easy to add on to. You just drill a few more wells. Right. Um, and your backup boiler would be sized for however you need it to be sized. Um, because if, if we size that now in a hybrid system to pick up 15% or those extra cold days where you don't want to drill those wells, then that's still there and that never changes. Um, and so we had thought about the concern of it's a tight site, which way do we go? The answer is we go up. And what that means is whenever you do that in the future, there's no earthwork involved. Um, and so there's future savings. And if, if you were just like gonna put a wing on a building um, and you got built in swing space. So, I, you know, I think that still a lot of work to do, still a lot of thinking of this and planning of this, but we are trying to keep that in mind yeah. as we organize the, the spaces that we're doing. It is a fifth floor. I, I know. It, I know that would create mm -hmm. a lot of going up and down stairs. But yeah. from a structural perspective, is a fifth floor an option? I can find out. Yeah. I think we'll, if you have solar panels on the roof, those would get relocated. Uh, we do have right above this area right here. We're thinking of a roof monitor, not skylights, but sort of a pop-up with clear story lighting. Um, and then again with a few holes in the floor upstairs so that we're bringing natural light into the core of that building, of that two-story uh, student space. But even that could be moved. In fact, I'm doing that right now at the Wolfboro Library. Got rid of their roof monitor. <laughs> Put a different roof on the building with solar tubes. So lots of different um, ideas and alternatives that we can do in the future, um, taking a look at the simplicity of the design and how do we go up. The nice thing about that is if you add a fifth floor, it still meets code. If you went to six floors, it becomes a high rise. Yeah. All different ball of wax. So you can add one floor because the, the building itself would most likely be a type 2A um, or 1B to begin with. And so that would, ac that would accommodate both a four-story building and a five-story building. Does uh, moving the SAU office to that corner, because I know that wasn't the original idea, how does that affect access and is it enough square footage still 
that you Yeah, want. so um, Ron and I have been talking about the uh, conference room for the <coughs> SAU facing the library with a collapsible wall. And so when we would have board meetings, the conference room would become the boardroom and we'd open up right into the library. So we take advantage of the library being there rather than, um, you know, trapping the superintendent's office in a corner with a hard wall, util utilizing the space in, in a way that we use this room, except it would be permanent. But how would you, if someone was coming to the SAU office to have a meeting yeah. or whatever, so, how would they, would they go in yeah. the main entrance and someone yep. has to go get them? Yep, exactly. And, and that also contributes to the, to the safety aspect of the building because every person would be greeted by the front office, Jay's office, if you will. They have an appointment with the superintendent or Sue or somebody in the office. Then we'd go out and meet them and bring them down. So always there would be security going on where the current so you building... You don't have your own door, separate door. We would have an outside yeah, door right. for staff, Here. but we would use, for visitors, we would use the, the front front entrance. So we're, we're trying deliberately to drive all traffic to the front of this building for security reasons. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you very Great much. Great questions. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Thank you, Ron. Yep. Thank you. And do you have presents for me? You can you can leave them and now and Todd Todd will take care of them for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we are announcements, uh, commendations, and comments from the district. But it was older than what he presented. It was not the same. Good evening, <coughs> David Goldsmith from Moharamit. I want to give you some updates uh, on some announcements that I made at the last school board meeting. Since that time, we did have our pancake breakfast. It was this past Saturday. Uh, it was a wonderful success. Uh, the jazz band uh, has been in Florida, so this was a pancake breakfast without the jazz band, uh, which was uh, sad uh, from a jazz band perspective. Uh, definitely changed the tenor of, of the pancake breakfast a little bit. We had a tremendous amount of people uh, attend. Uh, we had uh, wonderful entertainment, uh, Grimes Dance, who's been there for many years, Quest Martial Arts, some local uh, community members uh, and staff members uh, playing music. Uh, we had some students playing music. We had uh, a group from the high school raising money. We had a, a social and emotional learning table set up. Uh, we had uh, and, and 68 Hours of Hunger uh, having a table. So we had a lot of community uh, and high school and uh, town tables there. We also had a booth set up run by uh, Dr. Morse and Mr. Allen uh, advertising about and giving information about the middle school project. And that was very well attended. That was right in the main thoroughfare of everyone coming to the pancake breakfast, getting to stop and talk to either Dr. Morse or Mr. Allen, seeing some of the uh, design drawings, getting to talk about what was going on. Uh, and so I think that was a real big success for people to be able to talk to the superintendent. Uh, we began our construction project at Moharamut on Monday. That's also gone really well. The students, staff, Families, visitors have all been very flexible with the new entrance to the school through the West Wing, having to come to the office. Uh, students have been incredible, as have staff, with the uh, demolition noise that has been going on. The crew, the construction crew, has been very respectful to our school. There's clearly noise that's going to happen when there's demo happening, uh, and the students have just been really more interested in knowing what's going on than um, annoyed by it. They, they've been doing a great job. Um, and that's just moving on on schedule. And then, of course, next week uh, on April 10th, Wednesday, we have the free spaghetti dinner at Moharamit with the presentation about the middle school happening. That's also in conjunction with a Moharamit PTO meeting. The timing for that is 5.15 to 6 for the spaghetti dinner, 6 to 6.45 for the presentation about the middle school, and then 6.45 to 7.30 for the PTO meeting. There will be child care provided as there was at Mastway. Um, and so we're looking forward to a lot of people coming out to hear a more formal presentation by the district about the middle school. Any questions on any of that or anything else? 
Thanks very much. David, when's the last reminder you sent out to the community on the on the uh, supper? We sent one out today. We're going to send them out again this week and then at the beginning of next week as well. Okay, thanks. Yep. Jay Shire, principal of the middle school. Just a couple quick uh, notes. Uh, as David mentioned, the jazz band was not at the uh, pancake breakfast because they were down in Disney World. Uh, for a performance, I got a report from Dave Irvin this morning. Um, what an exceptional job. No surprise that the kids did. Uh, it was a late night for them. They didn't get back last night until about 1.30 in the morning. So a lot of tired kids today. And uh, But it was a great trip. A uh, few weeks, I'll be on a bus with 128th graders to head down to Washington, D.C. over April break. So I'm looking forward to that. And just wanted to highlight a uh, quick collaborative effort uh, to our neighbor Barrington. They did approve a world language program. They're going to attempt to hire two world language teachers. So I actually had a staff member, one of my world language teachers, go over there today to help with interviews because they've never had a world language uh, program before. And uh, the principal, Terry Leatherman, and his curriculum director are actually going to visit our middle school next week, which is exciting to see what I think is a tremendous middle school world language program. So just a quick example of uh, collaboration with our neighbors. So, so that will for sure be happening in the fall? Uh, that's their plan. What, yep. what are they planning to offer? Mm -hmm. language -wise, do you know? What's that? You know what languages they're planning to offer? Uh, they advertise for French, Spanish, and Latin. So it's one of those things where you just kind of try to find someone that's highly qualified to do that. I mean, I've mentioned that over the years to the board. That can be a challenge in terms of hiring the kind of people we want working with kids. So exciting stuff. Good evening, Lisa Huppy, Transportation Department. I wanted to acknowledge um, some of our bus drivers. Um, this past Friday, I attended the annual um, New Hampshire School Bus Driver Safety Awards banquet put on by uh, NHSTA and New Hampshire DOT. And they honor um, school bus drivers in five-year increments of safe driving. Um, preventable accident free and this year we had um, seven of our drivers receiving awards three of them received five-year awards one received a 20-year award uh, one received 25-year award 130 and 135 year award wow. next year we hope to have a 40 so thank you oh, that's wonderful Wow any other uh, district Board um, announcements, commendations? Yes. I have a couple. Uh, actually, so there, I I'm losing track of the dates, but it was a, like a week ago from last Saturday. Um, the In the library, there was uh, the Human Book Project. And the Human Book Project, I think it started in Europe. And the idea of the Human Book Project really kind of goes buried in this thing about diversity that we're supposed to be doing, is you're supposed to have uh, people that are very different from yourselves and that make potentially make you feel extremely uncomfortable. And it's an opportunity where you sit down and have a conversation and learn about them. And so you literally, uh, there was, uh, you know, people with disabilities, transgender, uh, brain injuries, um, vegan, you know, it was a mixed religious uh, group. And what you do is you check out for 30 minutes that person you sit down and talk and so I, I did an hour I my first um, half hour was uh, with Aziz who's a UNH professor in economics and we talked about what it's like to be Muslim in post 9-11 America and it, we really spent a lot of time talking about Yemen and the United States is really pers uh, participation in genocide currently and then the second half hour uh, I, I picked I thought I picked the toughest one I could get which was Jeff Jessica, which was a transgender woman, and we talked about her transition, and it was really pretty profound. And I think, you know, when we talked about, uh, we had that group come in before and talked about training and standing up when you see discrimination occurring, and she had this really amazing tale. So. It, I, it's just mind-boggling to me how difficult it is for somebody to go out in public as they're transitioning and facing that hump. And so what she told me is she had gotten 
comfortable enough and things, nothing had gone wrong and she was like, wow, this is easier than I thought. And so she went to a restaurant and she sat down and as she, the waitress came up to her, of course, the worst case scenario happened, the waitress was like, there's no way I can serve you. You're a total freak and made a humongous um, uh, scene in the restaurant and Jessica was like, you know, just floored. I mean, it was her worst case scenario. And another waitress said, you know, I only see another customer. I'll take that section of the restaurant and, you know, I'll take your tips, by the way. And, and she helped Jessica. She's like, you're going to be okay. What do you want to eat? And kind of made everything okay. And I said, uh, Jessica, I said, well, that's to me, the gold standard. That's what we really are trying to achieve when we talk about diversity. So I thought it was a really, really, really good project. I think it's something to keep in mind in the future for the district. Uh, the Mouth of the River actually wrote it up. And then the second thing, I had this weird week of like social justice last week. So the other thing was um, the UNH Multicultural uh, Center, uh, Lou Farrell uh, hosted what's called Safe Zone Trading, which is on gender identity, and I passed all the stuff along to Todd. And so it's, it's designed really, um, it can either be for faculty, for students, but in this case it was um, for businesses and nonprofits in downtown Durham. Uh, Lou is, Lou identifies as they, which threw me off. I'm like, wait a second, how can you use a plural pronoun if you're a single person? But it's really interesting discussion about gender and identity. And the, the uh, thing that you learn, particularly, uh, particularly with transgender, is how hypersensitive they are about their environments because it's such an incredible obstacle to be in an environment. And so the Safe Zone training really is about gaining awareness about that. And, and something as simple, by the way, as a sticker, which is the Safe Zone training, really lets, you wouldn't think, I would never notice this walking into a business, but it, they do and it means a profound amount that they know somebody's had training and that uh, there's a safe place for them to come in. So I, I thought it was really, really an excellent, excellent uh, opportunity and I, say, I think it would be a great, Lou is a phenomenal public speaker, uh, told about his experiences transitioning and uh, all of that, so I think it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity for both of our students and our staff. And it goes directly along with what's buried in here. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Al. I mean, it that's, um, sounds like incredible experiences. And just anecdotally, in my practice, I am prescribing hormones for people who are transitioning. And when you see a patient, you need to enter a diagnosis. And when you go to transgender, it says transgender disorder, and there is no way to enter. This is just who somebody is. So it shows the battle. I'm, you know, I know a couple of years ago we made our policy, but what a struggle and to bring that issue forward. Um, I appreciate that. Um, my second thing is how amazingly disappointed I am with the New Hampshire School Board um, Association with the efforts um, led by Tom Newkirk and, and also you, Dan, and the response that we get got from them I thought was meaningless, spacious, almost insulting. And I, you know, we, we were just talking about the middle school plan and we're talking about funneling people in the front interest and posting people of authority at corners. And here you can carry a gun in. And knowing the political makeup currently, we have a Democratic House, we have a Democratic Senate, and perhaps the bill that we would like to see that is limiting guns in our school might pass, but I worry with our Commissioner of Education and our Governor, is there a veto lurking? And I think our efforts of writing the letter were great, I think our efforts, New Hampshire School Board um, Association were great, but maybe it's time that we think about trying to lobby Governor Sununu and Commissioner Edelbutt and explaining how ridiculous it is that we're spending all this money to harden our schools, yet we're allowing people to walk into our schools with guns. Because it would be devastating to have the bill passed that we would like to see passed 
and have a governor veto that bill. And I don't know what our other options are, but I think we should do something more and not give up the fight. It's crucial. Any other board comments? I'm just curious as to what the reaction was at the booth at the pancake breakfast. How did that go? What was the response from the people uh, that you were speaking it was, to? It was incredible. I mean, it, Michael was there and he saw me mobbed by people as he was running, running after his, his toppleganger. <laughs> Michael's son is just like the spitting image of him. I tease him all the time. <laughs> the, um, the, the people were like super enthused super excited they had really great questions um, you know they were especially you know engaged if they had a second or third grader because they know that the child would benefit from the new school uh, if they had an older child who went through uh, they would talk about the need I mean it was really just by Todd and I being there that morning it just I think it was an amazing opportunity um, I would say it was equal to the presentation we did at Massway but much more personal one-on-one. -on -one. So um, we have other activities coming up. In May, we're gonna focus in on the, on the um, orchestra performance. We'll do a supper before that and talk about the um, performance hall. And so uh, we have a, we, we've developed a pretty comprehensive um, communications plan that we'll be sharing with you guys that will take us through the summer. Then in the summer, we'll look at what's coming up in the fall, but it's gonna, gonna keep us plenty busy. I, uh, I have not had a single person say to me yet, this is a stupid waste of money. I think people know the building, it's time, and it's, it, it seems to be receiving a really uh, good response from people. Seniors stopped and said, yeah, we know this building is old. You know, so it was even people who didn't have children in the school who had stopped for the breakfast because they had grandchildren or nieces or, or they just wanted to have pancake breakfast at Moharamit because they've done it before. Um, it, there were a lot of people who stopped. I mean, I didn't keep a net account, but I knew I was talking constantly for three hours. Okay, um, moving on, assistant superintendent report. You have in your uh, board backup a uh, document called Questions from the, uh, uh, hold on a second, what's it called? Questions from the cohort, uh, which is related to Chris Hall's um, sabbatical. Uh, I, I'm sharing that with you for a couple of reasons. One, it was really, I, I shared it with the ent entire staff at large and has all the different questions that people are, are researching. Um, and it's really, really engaged staff and, and some dialogue. Uh, all of the, the members in the cohort are in the process of setting up blogs where they're gonna be blogging about their research and so it's, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, uh, all of these projects will um, have the opportunity to, to do a presentation at the end of the year. Uh, they're scheduled and there'll be a lot more detail to come on this and I will make sure you have specifics because they haven't divided up which days, which presentations are gonna happen, but they have three dates set for May 21st, May 28th and June 4th to do six, of, six presentations uh, at, at each of those. The presentations are about 20 to 30 minutes each. Um, but it will be the, an opportunity to hear the teachers who've been spending their entire year researching these questions, share what they've learned and share it with their colleagues. Really exciting stuff, so uh, clearly board members will be invited to that as well, so please keep that in mind. Um, and, and another thing that came out of this project, which was very exciting, uh, Chris, at the beginning of the research, uh, was discussing it with all of the action researchers. Gee, this wouldn't it be kind of neat to do, uh, to present our findings at a national conference? So on a lark, they submitted um, our uh, proposal to the uh, NCTE, which is the National Teachers of uh, 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 English, and they've been, uh, been accepted uh, to present in Baltimore next fall, all the great uh, research they're doing. So not all of the projects, but it's, they're presenting on the concept of this action research cohort. Um, and it's really, I think, um, great kudos to the work that's gone on because this is sort of very unusual professional development that's going on, very exciting stuff. And Chris and I are in the process of trying to work out a plan to continue this once he's no longer on sabbatical because obviously that's the key is to 
because everybody in the cohort wants to keep going. Uh, it's a matter of how can you keep it going without having a full-time person sort of shepherding it along. So we're, we're, we're sorting that out, but very exciting stuff. The second thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, and actually kind of follows up on something Jay said, uh, he was talking about the World Language Department being actively involved with Barrington collaboratively. At last night's Barrington School Board meeting, a group of our, uh, Leslie Ayers, Barb Milliken, and Michelle Pinelli presented the, the, a similar to the presentation they gave you a year and a half ago, but with on, added on top of that um, a series of recommendations to assist Barrington to help determine their path forward. To kind of answer Michael's question about what's the language they're going to do, uh, after last night they heard from a Latin teacher from uh, Berwick Academy and the Oyster River uh, Spanish and French teachers, and I, I think they've arrived at they're going to pick the language that has the most passionate, excited, um, engaging teacher. So they did interviews today, and as as uh, as uh, uh, Jay mentioned, uh, Michelle Pinelli participated in that process. And I'm sure Michelle will be able to tell us who did you hire, and that will tell us what language they decided to do. But it's a, it's an absolute. They're going forward with it. They have two positions. So moving forward, Barrington will be uh, on this in many ways on the same page as uh, Oyster River is when, when they arrive at Oyster River High School. Um, on a similar note, relating to Barrington, um, uh, Barrington uh, started a collaborative meeting that uh, Oyster River High School. Cole Brown Academy in Dover all participated in with representatives from Barrington. It was a really great thing. It was held at Barrington Middle School uh, last month. And basically it was an opportunity for all of the different subject disciplines to talk about what the needs of their programs were, share with each other. I think it was a great opportunity for Barrington to learn about how they can better have their kids ready to be at Oyster River, but it was also an amazing opportunity for us to engage in conversation with our, co our, our uh, colleagues at other schools and learn a lot. So it was a really great thing, and that's a, an ongoing thing that uh, uh, Barrington is intending to host, and Oyster River clearly, as long as we're involved with Barrington, will want to be a part of it. Um, last thing I want to mention, I was hoping to be standing here tonight to tell you I just sent out the REACH catalog and I was going to actually stand here and do this big thing where I pushed the button. Uh, we've run into a technical glitch, so it's going to go out tomorrow morning. Um, um, so the REACH catalog will be out tomorrow morning. I'm, it, it, when, it, when it comes out, check it out. Um, it is amazing. We have a, just an incredible range of activities. Um, you know, I, I'm hoping we'll fill them all because with the two extended school year programs here at the middle school, we'll have like the entire place like jamming with people. So it should be a, a very fun summer uh, coming up. So be on the lookout for the for the catalog. So thank you. Todd, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, in one of the documents we have in our folder talks about the Barrington student enrollment. Yes. And our enrollment was not as high as we had anticipated. And I don't know if that's um, either based on the population of Barrington and how many kids they have going to high school or whether it's choice. But in addition to that kind of collaboration that you discussed, right. which I think is wonderful, should we be thinking of ways to market Oyster River to um, parents and students who are at that step of making, starting to begin that process of making choices? Is there anything we can do better? Yeah, we absolutely are looking at, at, at that issue. Uh, I mean, Suzanne and Heather and high school staff have had lots of contact with Barrington, in fact, um, uh, and they've been over to visit. They've uh, hosted tours at the high school. Uh, in fact, uh, I know Suzanne was talking with Terry Leatherman just the other day about are there any kids still on the fence that we could reach out and offer any additional um, guidance and, and information to help them make their decisions. Um, I think this year there's no question that the brand new Dover High School did have an impact on our, our enrollments and I think um, the newness of that certainly had an impact. Um, I, but we'll find out what the, what the trend is over, over the, the long haul. Uh, but I, I do think, yeah, you're right, we do need to maintain that contact with Barrington and really be trying to provide them as much as we can to, to make sure families have all the information they can get in order to uh, to come to us. I would say a, a lot of the kids um, that are choosing Dover um, right now, like I say, it's the facility, but a lot of times it ties into desire to be involved in the career technical programs which are housed right there and, and, and minimizing that. So there's a certain population that there's only so much salesmanship you can do. Um, 
because they're looking for a program. And from a, from a Bar if I were a Barrington parent, and by the way, my grandkids are Barrington students and they will ultimately one day be in, in this situation, they have the best of all worlds. They have three choices so that they can find the right match for their kids. So. And, and I think that's all fair, and, um, and certainly we have our academics to promote Absolutely. our kind of burgeoning wellness, mental health kind yes. of thing. Um, we have our athletics. Absolutely. I wouldn't neglect our food services, because I remember when my daughter was looking at college. That's an interesting thought. When she went to eat at the different places, yeah. that kind of made something, and I think our Food service. It's funny stellar. you should say that. When my son was touring colleges, I remember when we discovered this really good pizza at the Memorial Union building of, of the a particular university that rose to the ranks of his top choice. So it's interesting <laughs> so you should mention that. Food could be used. Yeah. Are you hearing this, Suzanne? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Superintendent's report. Well, since Kenny asked the question about enrollment, I would just say let's continue down that path and go over what we're seeing right now. Um, so the kindergarten has grown um, 18 students since registration. So that's changing the dynamic quite dramatically. And I gave you a, a copy of where we saw the enrollment. So right now we have, as of today, 62 students uh, planning to attend Massway and uh, 52 students planning to attend Mohammed. Um, so I'll leave that for a second and then come down to the Barrington issue, which Kenny raised. Uh, the Barrington issue is one of these issues that right now is continuing to fluctuate. So like three weeks ago, it was 50. And then kids who had choices between Cobra Brown, Dover, and us, nine of them or eight of them made a different decision. Um, there's still kids on the fence, and Suzanne said to me yesterday that she plans on going over and, and trying to um, uh, convince some of those kids to come, come to Oyster River. Um, so this actually kind of settles into a place where I thought we would be when we first made the agreement with uh, Barrington. I thought <coughs> we would hover in around 170, 175 um, students. I do think that the new Dover High School has played a factor this year. And um, so I wanted to make sure that, although this is the number as of today, we'll be monitoring this over the next uh, many weeks to see if this is where it settles or whether it'll grow a little bit more or whether it uh, doesn't grow a little bit more. So I wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. But nine students is 151128 tuition dollars that we were planning on in the next budget that we wouldn't have. Um, one of the other things that David and Carrie and Todd and I decided was in order to take the pressure off grades three and four, um, David is going to again go with a multi-grade three, four. And then that opens up the opportunity for the parents that we um, said couldn't go to their closest school last summer. It opens up the opportunity to invite them back to either of the schools. So we did have youngsters who lived um, close to Mohermet that we are sending all the way to Massway. We had youngsters who were close to Massway that we sent all the way to Mohermet. And you know, on the surface, that is a bizarre thing to do. But what we were trying to do is uh, protect the class sizes based on policy 2B or IIB, which, you know, we, we try to keep class sizes reasonable and the upper elementary at about 22 to, two to 1. But um, even with the 3-4 uh, combination, the class sizes in the upper elementary are all going to be pushing towards that limit um, as we speak. Um, so the, the issue for us really is um, the kindergarten. And of course, with the new addition at Mass Way, we do have room uh, for a kindergarten there. But what I, um, what I would recommend at this point is that we watch the kindergarten enrollment over these next several weeks and come back to this issue. Um, because part of it is if I, if I, and I, I'm leaning in this direction, but um, if I recommend a seventh kindergarten, then I also need to figure out how I can recommend to you we can pay for it. And 
I don't have that tonight. Um, and I want to watch what's happening in both schools over these next several weeks. But even at these numbers, there's, if these numbers were where we were a month from now, I, I would be in the position of, of recommending to you that we need the seventh kindergarten. Um, these numbers go up. There's no question right now to me, there's no question. My question is I haven't had enough time with these numbers is literally these are updated as of today that Sue and I haven't been able to go through the budget and figure out how we would recommend to you the seventh teacher and then answer the question that you always ask, how are we gonna pay for it? Totally. So I need time to do that. And so I just wanted to plant the seed today. Tonight I'm doing my jo Johnny Appleseed routine. I'm, I'm planting a seed. Um, <laughs> Then just in related issues, the health insurance did... Can I just ask about uh, sure, um, enrollment? Sure, I'll Kenny, yep. Just um, trying to make sure I understand things correctly. Um, we, looking at Massway, when we ended in June, we had 71 kids in kindergarten, but the current first grade class, which would have reflect those kindergartens, grew to 84. So we gained 13 kids. And we had a similar bump of 10 as we went from first grade to second grade. I'm going to invite yeah. David and Carrie in up to the podium and so they can answer you so, that specific question. Okay. And, then, and then the one last thing is looking at Moharamit, um, we had that, those um, two big classes and now the current fourth grade, which has 90 kids, will be departing. And as of now, and knowing that could change, we're replacing that with a kindergarten of 52, which is a, a loss of 38. Is that, are those numbers correct? That Yes, yeah. I mean, David's population will be going down. Okay. Yeah. Just the, the class size, the class size rec recommendation numbers are what we hit up against for one, with the space of our classrooms as well, and then the opportunity to bring families back. That's the other piece of this, is that this year, due to the different disparities between the schools and the classrooms, we've had a number of families who have been placed at the other you know, elementary school, the one that doesn't match their address. Um, and while we know the education is wonderful, um, what it does for transportation and what it does for their neighborhood and students who are being driven to one school and then transferring to another bus and then going to another school, um, being able to give them the opportunity to come back, especially when they're in first or second grade and they still have a number of years to go in elementary school, having that 3-4 class gives us the ability to do that. Right. Even if that doesn't happen, giving, having the 3-4 class gives us the opportunity to accept new enrollments because we also know, sort of like the questions you were asking about the middle school, we can't project exactly what's going to happen, but we know that we will get new students throughout the year, we always do, and so that would give us some wiggle room in there as well. Right. So that makes sense. Um, one thing they think might be interesting to figure out is if that bump from kindergarten to first grade did they represent new families in our community or did they represent families who opted out of our full day K, did a part-time K, and now are joining our system? Because that might help inform us in I think most of, them are new, most of them are new families. New, new yeah. family. wow. So that but, indicates yeah. a, a growth. I, that, yeah, but we also know that um, some of the kindergarten programs are ending that are outside of the district. Mm -hmm. So some of the options that have been available in the past for families are no longer options as well. So those are families who have been in the district who just are now coming to us. Great, thank you. Thanks. Would we ever consider a split K-1 class? Um, we did a multi-age 1-2 class and it was challenging. I think it depends on, I've done, I've done different here and in other districts, it depends upon the great configurations being together and also I feel strongly about having partner teachers um, so that if you do want to kind of separate out for certain curriculum areas you can and that you have a partnership in balancing two grade levels and um, it, it's a lot. I, I also think that there's a philosophy behind a multi-age classroom 
that is separate from using it as a solution for numbers. And I totally recognize that we have to make these decisions based on numbers as well, so I'm, I'm not putting that aside. But t when you make create a multi-age class, there is a, a thought process that goes behind that. There's an impact on the children and an expectation for their time. So it's usually more than a one-year commitment, and there has to be an expectation of, for example, if there's an aide in the kindergarten class and there's a students new coming in, how that all manages, how they switch to first grade, and then are we believing in that model and are we using it and does it match our curriculum or are we just using it as a solution for numbers and those are sometimes contrary to each other a little bit. Yeah. yeah. How, how small is too small for a kindergarten class? Too small? Yeah. I've never heard of too small in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. I mean <laughs> From an educational, from an education point of view, five children would be a great class. Yeah. Well, um, there's, but, there's research, know. Michael, that the ideal class size for a kindergarten and first grade is 14. Mm -hmm. That would be what the research would support. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, so that will be continued. Um, last year, for the first time, the school board was asked to authorize the board chair to sign um, the general assurance document from the Department of Education that goes to the Department of Education and the federal government. Historically, I mean for generations, from the, the in inception of this document, this was signed by the superintendent. Um, alone, and basically it just says we'll comply with all the federal requirements related to accountability, financial accountability. Um, so uh, the board last year authorized Tom to sign this along with me, so I need a motion from the board that would allow Tom to sign the general assurances form. I move that we allow Tom Newkirk to uh, sign the general assurances form. Is there a second? Okay, Brian, all those in favor? All right, six in favor and the student rep in favor. Uh, thank you. Um, normally this is something that Tom would do when we lose somebody who's been connected to the district. Um, we lost uh, Gerald Smith. Um, Gerald Smith was the moderator for the school system from 1974 uh, and 75 school year to the 82-83 school year. Um, I just thought it would be nice for us to just recognize his service to the district and how much we appreciated that service during that time period. I also need another motion from the board to establish the last day of school. Um, based on our calendar, it would be June Wednesday, June 19th. Since that's a calendar issue, it requires the board to um, take action. Um, I just have a question about that. Um, so how many days into the snow days does it extend? I, I didn't actually look at the calendar. Three days? Okay. And the reason we do this is because parents are constantly asking when's the last day of school. This gives them the freedom to do their summer vacations and um, staff also ask because of college courses and those kinds of things. So once, I mean this, this year is so dramatically different than last year, it's easy for us to establish in, uh, it tonight. Does Although that, we did have snow this morning. We won't have any more school closure? Is that, that is the assumption. <laughs> All right. Well, it did um, snow this morning. Yeah, and we've had floods in other years, but That's um, true. knowing how powerful Dr. Morse is <laughs> and that nothing would happen to throw this offline, I would move that June 19th be the day that we uh, make that the last day of school. Okay. Uh, I'll then, second that. Michael second. All in favor? I thought Yasmin would vote against that. <laughs> she wants the uh, 13th. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, do you want me to do the nomination of Heather right now, Denise? Sure. Okay. So um, we had a, a surprise uh, from my perspective. Um, wonderful surprise, but it was still a surprise. Um, Heather... Um, our director of counseling 
um, who used to be a counselor for us and then assumed the mantle of administration, has asked that she return to counseling. And um, it's really about how young her children are and the demands of administration and night meetings and so forth. And I can think of no one better qualified than Heather to take on the role of um, a counselor here at uh, the high school. And so I would nominate her to you this evening as uh, the fourth counselor at the high school. What that does is it opens up the director of counseling position, which we would advertise starting tomorrow. Motion, make a motion. Um, so I, I move that we um, approve Heather Mackinoff to uh, return to her role as a high school counselor with the budgeted amount of $96,000 as shown. Moved by Kenny. I'll second. Okay. Yeah. And second I would just want to yeah. comment. I just, um, I think Heather grew with us. Um, and I think one of our board missions really from the get-go as this board begin to, began to establish itself was our great concern about the mental health and well-being of the children in our di district. And I think it was new for us and it was uncharted territory. It was new for Heather. And I think she displayed amazing growth through this period and has really worked incredibly hard to establish a program that is really kid-centric, that really is addressing our kids' needs. I mean, the seeds are more than sown. The program is growing, and I'm really proud of what we're doing from that perspective, and I don't think it would have happened without um, Heather's um, passion in it and expertise in it, and so thank you, Heather. Thank you, Ken. That was very nice. Okay, we're ready to vote. All in favor? Six in favor, the student rep in favor. Then the last thing I would ask the board to consider is, um, you know, when we did the teacher retirement uh, incentive, we actually had three staff members come forward who had not expressed uh, interest in retiring. And my best guess is that just on those three people, the district will save about $70,000 in staffing, assuming that uh, we use Jay Richard's theory of staffing which is higher the best, but it doesn't necessarily meet, mean the most expensive. Um, the uh, support staff have asked if the board would consider something similar for them. Um, you have uh, three different unions and then one non-bargaining group. Um, I gave you a spreadsheet that gives you some of the ages of our support staff. Our oldest support staff member is 83. We have 76-year-olds and 75-year-olds. And um, so a lot of our, our senior, senior staff, I think, in the support group work because they love to come to work, truly. I mean, that's the only explanation I can, that, that I can have, um, that it's, uh, it revitalizes them and gives them a social um, network and, and so forth. Um, but others, uh, you know, could could be considering retirement if an incentive was offered. With the teachers, we offered twenty thousand dollars or thirty percent. Um, with the support staff, where their salaries are so much lower, um, I would suggest eight thousand dollars or twenty percent. Um, for some people, that would mean twelve hundred dollars as an incentive others it would mean the full eight thousand as an incentive but I'd ask the board to, to consider that um, I do think um, it's worth worth your consideration I would suggest um, the possibility of two people from each unit um, as as the goal and I'd ask for your guidance um, I I think that to, um, if, if, and I understand what you're saying is that not everyone's going to probably take um, the incentive, but I, I would be concerned about the amount if all eight took, took the incentive. And so I would like to suggest that maybe we um, approve one from each of the units instead of two from each of the units as a maximum. So, I mean, I, given that you're given a bad financial news to start with and our needs, um, my, my thought really would be to stagger 
the teacher and the paras. I don't really think it's a great idea to do them at the same time, particularly when we have uh, a hole to fill to come up with money. Um, the other thought is, can you give me what the savings, projected savings would be? Yeah. Uh, I So I'm looking at the larger salaries, um, and um, I would say that there's a possibility of um, 15,000 in a RESPA, possibility of um, probably as much as 40,000 in the, if, if I'm just looking at all of those salaries, if all of those people retired, just giving you a general answer, mm -hmm. Al, based on what I would expect would happen. It's probably as much as 40,000 in the non-union and then in the Orbda group and the Orpass group, it's, it's probably peanuts. Um, but if you're going to offer it, I think you need to offer it across the board. Yeah, I so, I mean, you know, when you're looking at somebody who only makes $6,000 yeah. in the first place, it would be, that question would be, do you need to replace that worker? You know, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. And if we do, then there's probably minimal savings, if, if any, there. So the, the larger the salary, the greater the potential, the smaller the salary, not yeah. so much. I got it. Other, other comments? Is there anyone, we have a motion? Um, is there anyone who would like to make a motion? Can we wait till next meeting? Sure. I, I, I prefer not to make a motion of something I just picked up mm -hmm. like and haven't even had an opportunity to really look through. I don't think that's a good idea personally. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll table, table until next meeting. Yes. Was there any thought rather than having the set amount, and I think you mentioned 8,000, instead to have a certain percentage of um, current wage? Um, you know, if someone's making 20000 and someone's making, here's the high, I think is 63000 should those both be offered the same incentive or should it be more of a proportional thing to what the wage is? When we do it with teachers, most of them are at the top of the scale, so that wage is pretty much the same, but these are very disparate. I can look at that, Kenny, for the next meeting. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And that completes um, my report, okay. Denise. Okay. Uh, business administrator. Good evening. I have two items for you this evening. The first one is the bus bid. Lisa is here. I think. Is she? Anyways, we went out to bid for the buses. Um, we have two 77 passenger buses to replace and one wheelchair bus, two vans. Um, at this point in time, we are recommending two 77s for a lease with the money we have in the budget and one wheelchair bus for five-year lease. And then we will go out for the vans at a later date. Um, let's see, we have W.C. Cressy for both of them. They came in at the low bid and actually they're the bus that the drivers prefer. And I will, if, in, as far as the lease, I will be back for an official approval for a lease agreement. But we want to move forward and um, at least get the order in because there is a three to four month lead time on manufacturing these buses. Okay. Uh, so um, can we have a motion to approve the bus bid? Brian, is there motion a second? A second. Dan, <coughs> discussion? Okay. All in favor? Okay, six in favor, the student rep in favor. Thank you. And the other item I have is the annual audit. Um, you received the management letter in your packet. That's basically, um, tells you everything that you would probably need to know. Um, you could have gone out online and read the audit. I'm sure you all did that, <laughs> correct? Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have on the actual audit. Um, 
I have it here in hard copy. It's pages and pages. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, just in after our reviewing it, we have to go back and look and see how they all fit into our books because there were 21 reclassing entries because they have to report differently than we track. So um, I guess I, I have to say that it, I struggle when someone asks me questions about it because it's hard to present uh, you know, this information. And it is governed by the federal government, the Government Accounting Standards Board, and um, yeah, that's all I can say questions. Basically the management letter tells you that we had um, a couple of items that they noted, very minor items. Um, one of them was last year, it's been resolved. Um, single audit, we had a single audit this year because we did reach the 750, so that's also um, posted online. And then we have to pair, prepare for yet another GASB um, statement and that deals with activity accounts and whether or not we need to um, get that voter approved and have the treasurer sign those checks. So that will be interesting to see how that shakes out. But other than that, questions about the audit? And certainly if you want to look at it and talk with me privately, have specific questions, I'm happy to do that too. W will the other guests be on leases affect us in any material way? Um, yeah, so that one's interesting and I think that's come about because a lot of um, Building projects are now going to leases. So yeah, we've had a discussion about that and, and I understand that. So um, it'll just mean that we put it in a different budget account. Currently we now have it in the operating budget in the CIP. So we'll probably put it in the district account with the bonds. Where we have, you know, we have bonds and interest as separate. It'll be lease and lease payment, lease interest. That's what they're suggesting. That's the difference in that one. But, but it doesn't affect it doesn't affect the overall position, it's just how you present it okay. and where it, where it shows up. Um, that's basically what all of the GASB um, recommendations or procurements mean, it's how you present it. Um, some of the things, well one of the big things that we now um, have on your books, and if you look at our books you'll see this big negative number, that's the unfunded liability for New Hampshire retirement. It's a number, it doesn't really affect it, but it has to be reported. So those are the kind of things you'll see on the audit report. Used to show up on the state's books. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, student Senate report. Um, to start off, I wanted to congratulate Ms. Milliken for being nominated for a Teacher of the Year Award for the state of New Hampshire, which is pretty impressive. Um, the Scholar Athlete Ceremony just happened yesterday, and next week, is PSATs and SATs for sophomores and juniors, and on the same night, there's going to be a college financial aid night. Um, April 10th is the beginning of the fourth quarter, and April 13th is the National History Day competition. And tomorrow, the DSU, which is the Diverse Students Union, which is what I'm a part of, um, is going to, down to Dover High School to go to an event called Dream, which is basically like a place where we get trained on how to have conversations around race, so that's gonna be pretty interesting to um, go to. What, what's the date of that, Yasmin? Um, tomorrow, it's gonna be April 4th. Uh, 4th of May? Um, April, April it's tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh, yeah. it's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Ah. Excellent. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. you. Let's see, the sustainability report. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Brun, sustainability coordinator. And I'm Maggie Morrison, sustainability coordinator. Uh, so we're gonna uh, talk about a uh, couple things tonight. Um, in your packet is a very sort of brief overview, the last year, kind of the last two years, um, what we've done. And then uh, added today was an article from um, the Journal of Sustainability Education. So I'm gonna read just a little piece of that because we wanted to take just a little bit of a deep dive into um, Education for Sustainability. Uh, the acronym is EFS and we referenced that at the top of the, um, the handout that was in your packet. So. Education for sustainability functions as a powerful rationale for teaching and learning in the 21st century. 
It can be defined as a transformative learning process that equips students, teachers, schools, and informal educators with the knowledge and ways of thinking that society needs to achieve economic prosperity and responsible citizenship while restoring the health of the living systems upon which our lives depend. Education for Sustainability explicitly recognizes the role of teaching and learning in shaping the future we want. In this context, sustainability is viewed as a preferred condition. Currently, there is a large gap between society's aspirations for a healthy and sustainable future and the knowledge, skills, and attitudes being taught and acquired in the majority of K-12 schools. A long-term goal of the field of education for sustainability is to demonstrate the unique value of sustainability as a context for the whole school and curriculum and for the larger community. In the six years I've held this position, this community supported initiative has evolved and continues to be nimble and responsive to the needs of teachers, students, and administrators. For example, this year we had three UNH interns to help with our after school programming and as a transportation fellow. Today, fourth graders from Moharamet and Massway learned about solar and alternative energy at Durham's solar field. As you know, we took six students to the Youth Climate Leaders Academy in Vermont this fall. We recently gathered a Next step Steps working group to look forward to the next few years. Using the framework of education, educating for sustainability with the goal to deepen the culture of sustainability in all the schools in the community, the working group is looking for next steps as a sustainability integrator, which would be a half-time position that works with all schools. This position would work closely with Todd Allen to develop an education for sustainability leadership team. Just wondering if you have any questions about what we've done this year or about the framework of EFS. Um, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the elementary school sustainability programming? I, I know that you said that you took them out to see um, the solar. Was there other, other things that were done at the elementary level? Because it, it, it said you implemented the elementary level after school sustainability programming. Uh, we had a Earth Ambassadors program for fourth graders. It was a six-week program in which uh, we uh, offered that to all fourth graders at Mass Way. We also did that at Moharamet last year as well. And, and what was involved in that? The, so the content material, what was the content? Um, so it changed, we, uh, last year we had an intern that we worked with, this year we handed it off to two interns that um, developed it. Um, so they did a variety of things. There was a day that they looked at endangered species, uh, they did a composting day, uh, they sorted through trash and looked at what was in the trash and talked about what should, where the trash should be going at the school. Um, I'm missing two days. Um, mm. Seed balls? Yep. And then we made, uh, we did a day where we, uh, the kids made seed balls to tie into the um, endangered species. Uh, we were using lupin seeds for the Carson, Carson blue butterfly, which is an endangered uh, butterfly that needs the lupin plant, the common lupin. Uh, so we did that as well. So it was it was a it was a rich program. What we find with um, the challenge with the after school at the elementary level is the kids really are ready to be outside and moving and and content sitting and focusing isn't so much what they want to be doing as uh, which makes sense you know as a parent that. They weren't. They're not quite ready for it. We'd, we'd rather see this as a program that happens uh, integrated in the fourth grade and working with the teachers, so that we would still use our UNH interns, but it would be modules, like maybe a six-week session, um, where the the interns would come into the classroom, do these sessions over a period of time, um, as opposed to having it as an after-school activity. I think to that point, and maybe it's happening, but. Um, to me, the school gardens are just the perfect place to get kids out of the classroom. But the wealth of knowledge from there, uh, learning about soils, learning about plants, learning about what parts of the plant we eat, learning about seeds, 
um, math is involved in that, and it's active learning. So I, I don't know how much we're utilizing those school gardens and then getting into nutrition and getting into the, teachers the are. agriculture system in our country, just so much knowledge to come yeah through, the teacher yeah the teachers and uh all the, even the high school as well um there's gardens at all the levels and two not this past summer two summers ago jim rosicki and i worked closely together to do a lot of work on the gardens especially in the mast way courtyard um and at moharamit and so that's it's not something we've offered support um, as they need it, the teachers in, around the gardening, um, but they're pretty much doing their thing uh, in the gardens. It's not, it's not through us. Um, and they know they can, you know, and I'll answer questions. My background is as a master gardener. Um, and so every now and then we'll, they'll have questions or need resources, but um, the teachers are doing a lot of gardening. Uh, so first of all, thank you for all of your work. Uh, I'm going to go to where it says administration, where it says continue support uh, efforts by facility department to manage three streams of waste at all schools. Uh, so as anyone who's read the newspaper knows, the solid waste management has completely changed. And so I think... Um, what I often find, it's weird because Kenny and I both wear two hats, the school focuses on sustainability within the school system and is remarkably detached from the community. And so uh, while they're focused on your three streams, we in the community are grappling with a, a really significant change in our solid waste contract. We are beginning in Durham to, we're in May, we're coming forward with a presentation on pay as you throw uh, to the town council and doing two public sessions. I could not think of any better opportunity for your sustainability students to see a presentation presentation to soup to nuts from like presentation to actual implementation and it is like every single solid waste program in the seacoast is grappling with this problem and uh, it's so I, I I look at what you guys are doing and I would really like you guys, I mean, I can only extend a hand. I hope you guys reach out and take it, but it would be nice if you guys actually kind of became more aware outside of yourselves to, to integrate with the community and be part of what is a solid thing because while you teach everything at the school to throw in those bins, they go home at the end of the day. And everybody's in, in Durham is going to live with what we're implementing. So I, I think that's my first suggestion. I think it's a really, really big thing. The second was, I mean, I, ironically enough, I kind of circled it, which is the recommendation at the high school, which is the sustainability club. And it was like, I think having an after school club is not sustainable, <laughs> ironically <laughs> enough. Uh, it is like, so I, I saw like John Bromley, what he did today is big, really wisely uh, implement using flex and working with that because I think that's the way to do it. I think while an after school program may work at the elementary level, it's certainly not going to work at the high school level. No way. Not with all the activities and sports that are going on. So it's a, a rethinking of how that is working. Uh, and then the third thing I'll throw out there is the what I have coined the plastic conundrum. And the plastic conundrum is we have forgotten, it seems, but we had this, we make money off of plastic bottles, we kind of uh, grappled with how to deal with it, and so, I don't know, what I'm hearing, and I may be wrong, is we've now implemented smoothing, it's not enough that we had plastic bottles, but we then have now added a smoothie machine that asks, adds a plastic cup, a plastic lid, and a plastic straw. So we're kind of moving in the wrong direction. So my question, we had grappled with this for sustainability. This is a real life thing. This is $60,000 in our budget. You want a real life in-service thing? Give us an answer or solution or grapple with that problem of how do we deal with a plastic conundrum. So those are my two soup, uh, uh, soapbox things. But again, I think one, integrating more with the community in a real life problem and two, internally dealing with plastic, because plastic is clearly one of the most significant issues that we face. 
I, and I think, Al, that's a fabulous point of bringing in this whole idea of looking at sustainability and looking at it as a community issue and how can we get our students involved in real world, what's really happening today in our community. And so we, we've talked about that already. So I think we'll have to connect with John on that. And yeah. then the plastic, um, the VEEP students are um, really committed to working on the plastic. They were the ones that told uh, me, Maggie and I, about the new smoothie machines with the lids and the straws and that are very popular and they actually, totally. and they have them at the middle school too, which I, did, I learned from my STEC kids that they're so very we've popular. So accelerated our problem. The plastic conundrum has not declined, it's grown. Because now we make more money off of plastic. Right. So it's, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, I would really like to see, um, to the extent that it's possible, to have the students really work through that problem. And they've already started talking about, can we talk to um, food service about having reusable smoothie cups and forgoing the lids and maybe some kind of metal straws. And so I think to the extent that we can have students have the ideas come up through the students as opposed to us saying this is how you're going to do it or this is how we're going to fix this i think it's going to be a much more sustainable change um i don't know if you no i think it's a learning opportunity for the students they're going to have to yeah. deal with this problem they're going to grow up and have to live in their own community so they need to become the problem solvers right. but but i think to al's point and i agree completely and, and also love the work that you're doing we're giving mixed messages because we're giving the message, oh, you can throw your plastic in this bin and isn't it great you're recycling the plastic, but knowing there's no market for the plastic right. anymore. We talked about trying to get rid of water in bottles and then all of a sudden we present students with, rather than water, we pr provide them with these wonderful, sweet, whatever smoothies and we're telling them, no, it's okay, because then you can just put the plastic right in that bin and everything's fine. And, and I agree with you that when things originate from the bottom up, it's really much more um, sustainable, it's much more of a learning effort, but I think we as leaders, sustainability coordinators, need to help shape that kind of process. And, and to be very involved in that. And as Al said, he's willing to be involved and I'm willing to be involved as well because I agree we're drowning in plastic, you know, and you know, what New York State just banned plastic bags. You know, there's legislation in Concord to try to do away with plastic bags in our state. Mm -hmm. But we keep, think of the plastic we go through day after day after day that we really don't need and, and somehow I think we Really well, try we're, to we're looking for short-term gain, which is the money that you need for the budget versus the long-term consequences. Yeah. So but, but I think as we talked about with our plastic bottles, right, it's money, but it's tainted money. And I think we should, as a school board too, I think we're obligated to find ways to fund, help supplement our budget without money that's coming with a high price to be paid. By future generations, so I, it's on us. I know what I'll throw out there too is like so. As I hold up this, this is <laughs> this when when kids recycle. There's some recycling is cha it used to be we made money off of recycling. We don't make money off of recycling. This costs $135 a ton to recycle. If I throw it in the garbage, it costs 70. So it is it is profoundly changed. So I think st students need to understand that. Uh, it, Communities are grappling with the idea just to completely scrap recycling altogether. It's like in Durham, we have gone from single stream to split stream. We're using uh, car the value of cardboard to bring paper down to $100 a ton, and we're using uh, metal to bring uh, glass, which is absolutely worthless and heavy, and plastic down to $35 a ton. So it's like it, students need to, I mean, I, I think they need to understand this. They don't really have a sense of how profound we, this is. We all need to understand it, Al, not just the students. <laughs> That's right. a good point. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, you, Thank you very much. Right. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you for what you do. Okay, so um, school board committee assignments. Um, so I believe I, I, it, the, there's a 
that basically, I don't know if there's anyone that um, wants to make a change. I know that um, Brian has um, volunteered to be on the uh, policy committee to replace Tom, who uh, feels like he's very involved in the middle school plans right now and has kind of has his hands full. And so, um, so Brian has uh, volunteered to take over Tom's spot for that. Um, is there, are there any other um, changes I would like to see? I think that first committee is no longer yes, in the, existence. The, um, facilities the facilities com committee, that is correct. We no longer need the facilities committee. Michael, did um, Todd have, Tom have a chance to talk to you about his idea related to um, yes. the board reporting? Uh, yeah. Okay. Is that okay with you? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for yeah. reminding me. Yes. So, so I'm able to um, be writing up the articles that would reflect our board meetings. And also, uh, Michael, I had said that as uh, if you're willing, um, and Tom is willing, that and and, and Brian as well, um, as Jay and Todd and I write one pagers, themed one pagers around the new middle school. Would the three of you be willing to? kind of give them an overview and make suggestions, editing suggestions. Okay. You, don't have to, you don't have to write them, we'll write them, but it'd be good to have a set of eyes look at them from the committee, and then once we get your feedback, we'll keep them up and, and publish them. And the, the idea is that we'll try to create one-pagers on different themes on the middle school as part of our communications effort. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so I believe we, do we need, do we need a motion for the committee assignments or not? I think they're appointed. They're appointed. Yeah. yeah. So okay. these are Tom's appointments. All right. So if everybody's I'm agreeable, good. then. We're good. We're good with Tom's appointments then. Okay. Um, I am looking at the time and where it's already nine o'clock. I'm wondering if maybe we should take a five minute break before we move on to, um, taking a look at the strategic plan. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Five minutes in. We can't hear you. Name tags. We did. Our names are. Was that here last week? Last time I didn't notice it. The page is actually. I still don't think so.
Okay, are we ready? Get back into. That's yeah, such a huge asset to have that. It's like wow. Todd was very enthusiastic. Yeah, it's a good one to think about. I told myself it as clear as any problems from you guys. Okay, so plan. Um, so uh, initially we had pr uh, planned to make this the first read um, of the tr strategic plan, much like we do policy, um, but um, I was unable to get the completed plan out to you in a way that you'd have it for you know a week or so, which was my intent. Um, what I did was um, went through one more phase of editing with the um, administrators, sent their sections out to them, asked them to review it one more time, um, attempted to make all the changes that the board had asked. Uh, so tonight really is just a, a, a brief feedback loop, if you will. Um, we'll come back to this in two weeks as the first read. But if there are things that um, stand out to you that we didn't quite hit in the revisions, this would be a good time to tell me and we'll take that shot in the next two weeks and see if we get it closer. Um, Tom has provided um, written uh, changes that he'd like to see. Um, and I could just share those with the board since he's not here to share them. Um, he wanted the language on common assessments in the middle school. Um, he felt it hadn't been changed, um, uh, that any reference to common, exam common exams should be removed, and creating a common exam is a very time consuming and is unlike the teams can do this on a monthly basis. So he's concerned about the workload and the idea that every exam would be common. Um, and we actually agree with that and clearly we didn't make the changes that reflected that. Uh, the language for the extension of foreign language should be modified. Uh, Tom's feeling on that is it's, um, it's uh, we, the board itself has made no determination to extend instruction into the middle elementary schools and um, that's a process that we need to go through as a board before um, it's included in the strategic plan. And his last comment was um, that in the succession plan, uh, a one year overlap should be put forward as an option, not as a fait accompli. Um, and so those were his three, his three thoughts. And certainly, um, if everybody's in agreement at the, at the table, we'll we'll modify those. Actually, two of those three thoughts were part of the collective conversation last time we had. So I know that it's consistent with what what you all wanted. Are there any other um, <coughs> any other obvious um, places where the school committee would, the school board, would like to see us modify language or add language that we missed? So, um, I just had two comments, um, and they're old comments, but I guess I feel I always need to keep making them. In reading the transportation strategic plan, I continue to feel we're really missing a big issue by uh, not looking at what scheme we use for transportation, and instead of making the modifications that are made here, I have a feeling our transportation system is archaic. It's not meeting the goals or the needs of our community. It's leading to incredibly more fossil fuel use. Um, whether we do the middle school or not, that, and whether the, the cars queue up on a public road or not, they're gonna queue up somewhere. Uh, went to a meeting at the SAU office that we had scheduled for, I think it was like 3.15, totally couldn't get there. I, I think we're, by not looking outside the box in transportation, um, we're really missing something and I think it ties into what we talked about with sustainability. And I also want to express again that I think we should be aggressively moving to world language. Um, we talk about inclusivity, we talk about um, recognizing others. We're living in an age where um, anti-immigration um, language is used in our country and in many other countries. I think the science stands behind really diving into um, foreign language, um, other languages at early ages. We've 
try to use science, when we looked at late start time, when we looked at cell phones, and I think for our watering down, and, and I guess the other thing is we've really heard from parents, and I think if we went out and we surveyed our parents, um, we've heard from vocal ones, I would feel that the parents of our younger kids would overwhelmingly want us to be investing in foreign <coughs> language. So I wouldn't want to water down what we had. I would actually want to double down on that. I think so. I think that's, that's a part a, of a that's a, a good discussion for the board to have together at the next next reading because that would be the first read. And if there's a difference of opinion, we need to find out where that common um, agreement is. So. Mm -hmm. I just make, to make a comment, I think, and I kind of agree with Tom, I think the, the concern, and, and I share this concern, is that where there's places where it says there will be, as opposed to saying we'll explore the possibility or we'll, you know, kind of making it a little bit more like not so hard and fast, because I know my concern is when we say that we will have a K through well, in, you know, by 2024, I mean, other, this is a, a document, a public document, and I, I just, I really worry about in terms of the financial cost, plus we don't even have the report, you know, back from the <coughs> committee. So I know, speaking for myself, but I, I think from what Tom's comments is similar, is, is just to kind of soften that language, to kind of make it more of a, this is, yes, this is a goal we are working toward, but not something that, yes, we're going to have in place um, by, by that. That's, that's and and, and I, I get that completely, and I guess, to me, a strategic plan, although it's very concrete, is also aspirational. And because we have it as a strategic plan, it becomes a goal, but it's really an aspirational goal. And if we find that along the way, we want to change any aspect of our strategic plan, I mean, whether it's for our language or whatever, as we start going through the steps and we find that um, we need to modify, I think we really should be open. Just as the kind of concern that you don't want a strategic plan that you put on the shelf and you ignore. I also think it's equally faulty to make a strategic plan and think that what you decided in, what are we, April, April of 2019, dictates exactly what we're going to have in April of 2024. I think this is a living document, you know, and I think it's, it's something, um, you know, and that very well is a difference of opinion, but that's, I think, why maybe I different than you is I'm trying to put out what might be attainable and what we should really strive for, realizing we might get knocked off course somewhat by realities of situation. But um, let's have that discussion maybe when Tom's back. And yeah, I was going to say the language. I think the language is probably the most controversial. To me, uh, when I think about the foreign language thing, I, we have actually doubled down because we approved a sabbatical to study the foreign language. So when, I, when I'm looking at the foreign language, I just want to make sure that um, how we are addressing it makes sense. And so if you're going to have a group to study it and you're going to have a sabbatical person to study it, I want to give them enough, I want to give them time to actually come up with, you know, realistic suggestions. So, um, so that, in terms of like softening the language, I really, what I'm, the softening the language really was, I think, in fiscal year, is that 1920? Is that the, the first one? Because we were potentially talking about the fall, and it, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to like a hard and fast say we're going to have it in uh, 1920 if we, to, to not allow the things that we've put in place to study it to work. Why would we have given a sabbatical on foreign language study if we, it's already, we've already decided it? So it, it doesn't, I think we want to let the process play. I think all we've really done is kind of soften the 1920 year to kind of move it to, it's a 2021. That's my two cents, but I think that is a discussion we'll have to have. Yeah, it's obviously something where the board needs to get engaged. Michael, did did you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah I have a few. I have a few points to, to add to the conversation. On on that one specifically, um, maybe one thing we want to do is make the one of the world language annual goals even more explicit in terms of 
specifically updating the strategic plan. So we talk about developing a plan, but but if we were to say to ourselves, to our future selves, yeah. um, th that <laughs> by the end of the next school year, we want to update the strategic plan based on all the work that the committee and the sabbatical the are doing, from that. That, that would be a more concrete reminder to us to go back and look at the yeah. whole, whole five-year plan. Yeah, it would make more sense. Um, there are a couple of things I think might be helpful or at least worth thinking about adding in general. Uh, one is a communication goal, and I, I haven't given this a great deal of uh, detailed thought, but I think it would be around um, making sure that we're using appropriate methods to reach both the school and non-school communities, and, um, and even stakeholders and partners outside of the immediate community. Uh, we think we've been more active in, in terms of looking at legislation recently than we have in the past, and, and that by itself might merit um, a more thoughtful, long-term approach to how we engage with other districts around the state. Um, I still think having somebody whose job it is to be our communications expert is probably worthwhile. And so in terms of what went into that detail, I would, I would support a creation of a, a position at some point in time to specialize in communications. Um, another one would be we have, we have a number of different ways of looking at our programs and what kind of programs we want in the future. I, I think it would be interesting to consider um, a specifically outward looking group uh, that, is, that is tasked with looking for best practices, progressive techniques, just kind of across the board outside of the district. Um, Open-ended, what's new? And, and taking an assessment of, should we be thinking about bringing these, these things into the district? So, so actively, um, actively spending some time looking outward. On a more specific note, um, I appreciate the conversation we had earlier around safe zone training, and I would totally support including that as a specific element of this, um, of the plan. And um, and there's one going, you know, building off of what you said, Kenny, on transportation. I, I'm not ready to sign on for uh, the electric uh, bus fleet objective. I, I think that that needs some more thought before we get to having that really as a, as a goal. So I'm not I'm not in favor of the way that's laid out at this point in time. Uh, and then finally, I really appreciate the the budget breakdown uh, or budgetary impact, potential budgetary impact breakdown that you gave us last time. I think there are some things that are significant contributors of that that are not there, such as the electrified bus, electric bus um, item was not in there. Um, additional administration to have overlap in either the superintendent or the business administrator succession planning is not in there. So um, I think it would be helpful to have, you know, now that we have a updated, complete updated package, to go through and, and, and try to capture what the budget impact would be. Will do, thank you. Dan, did you have any um, suggestions? Um, just a thought on the earlier conversation in terms, I think there's an opportunity to sort of frame the context of this strategic plan with some sort of a forward that the board could. Yeah, we on. haven't, we, we, we would create a, a whole introduction to the right. plan that we haven't created yet. We just so, need to get these nuts and bolts pieces done and then we'll, yeah. we'll create the the introduction. Right. So I, I mean, I share, I share those same concerns about being, you know, maybe um, too um, concrete in stating that this will happen at this time. Um, but as you know, as Kenny said, it's a living document. It's a, it's a path forward. And if we make it clear that, you know, this is a vision at a point in time that will change, I think we can allay a lot of those concerns. Um, where folks might take that concrete view of, well, you said at this point this will happen and you didn't do it. Um, we can address that. Yep, all right. Brian, did you have anything? No, nope. actually, they stole all my thunder. Good. I was just gonna say thank you to the staff for coming mm, to all yeah. of these <laughs> multiple meetings at nighttime when you have the daytime stuff to do. It was really, it was really appreciated. Oh, There's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, so I do have a couple <laughs> more. Um, more I am I am definitely because I am looking at the staffing breakdown and adding all these positions it's like half a million dollars is a lot of money um, so I'm looking at certain ones and and I'm just not sure um, 
as we heard tonight about the sustainability coordinator, I can certainly understand, you know, the what the intent is. I'm not sure that again I, you know, to, to specifically say in the strategic plan that we're going to develop a budget and job description for the sustainability coordinator. I don't know that I can be on board with that because I am looking at you know, we're going to have to maybe need a new kindergarten teacher. You know, I'm just really mindful with the middle <clears throat> school coming on board and other maybe necessary positions. I just, you know, I just don't know that I can say, okay, yes, let's add this position. Plus the flattening of the revenue barrier. Exactly, exactly. So I'm, I'm concerned about that one. Um, were there other positions as well? Um, the other were, there was the also the, the, um, SEL coordinator, um, which I'm not sure is quite reflected. Part of it was sort of the wording on this sheet was a little different than in the strategic plan. In the strategic plan, um, it's listed as the K4 SEL coordinator to support Mast, Way, and Moharimut. Um, I'm not exactly sure because it's not listed that way here, just mental health, one position. So I am somewhat concerned about at, well, I certainly understand again, you know, we wanted to expand the high school. We've added a counselor position. I'm just not sure that that that's another position that I would have some concerns about. Um, so yeah, those were kind those of the two. two areas that I just have concerns about creating new positions at this time. So I think tonight's conversation is really helpful because, you know, just in terms of this conversation, you can see where there's agreement and you also can see where it's going to be a spirited discussion in relation to some of these issues. So this was helpful. Um, I'll take a stab at the simple things where I don't think there's any controversy and then we'll have the big conversation in the first read um, at the next meeting. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I also wanted to point out before we leave the strategic plan that uh, Jim had provided the capital improvement plan that he projects over the five years and that was a direct request of Michael so he could and all of us could see where we were headed and how we were matching our capital plan against um, the middle school. Um, and um, so so Jim did a really nice job putting that together and uh, that can feed into the conversation in two weeks as well. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Okay, um, so looks like we are down to motion to nominate and approve non-tenured contract professional staff members. Yep. And this was the question that Michael asked the last time when these people come up, they come up tonight and um, all of these people have been evaluated by their supervisors and have been no uh, nominated to me if I can, uh, to come back next year and I'm nominating them to you. Can I have a motion? So I'll move to, uh, to approve the non-tenured contract professional staff members as submitted by the superintendent. Okay, second. Second. Okay, Dan second. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Six in favor? Motion to approve the Oyster River Middle School 2019-20 leave of absence. Brian? So a uh, motion to approve as requested. Okay, moved by Brian, second by Al. All in favor? Six in favor? Motion to approve the Oyster River High School Spring Coaches and Volunteers. So moved. Al, second. Oh, Brian? Okay, all in favor? Six in favor? Motion to approve the list of policies for second read and adoption. Um, I move that we um, approve on second read, so for adoption, sabbatical leave policy GCBD. Okay. And second, Brian, all in favor? Okay, six in favor. School board committee updates. I will say that the manifest committee met and uh, sure. manifest was approved. <laughs> we fulfilled our destiny. Yes. Any, any other committee updates? None? Okay. 
Uh, future meeting dates, our next meeting is April 17th. And just a reminder that we are doing the middle school presentation at Muharramet on the 10th. And if you can attend, that's great. Okay, um, so we have a non-public thing. So a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Al, second. and second by Michael, and all in favor. We are adjourned. Well, I had a, I had a oh. comment before we voted. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I just, just wanted to say that Denise <laughs> did a wonderful job chairing the meeting. And thank here, you here. for stepping in, Denise. Thank <laughs> you.